Are you ready to say goodbye to the constant ups and downs of the artist income roller coaster? Whether you're a full-time artist who wants to increase and stabilize your income, a part-time musician who wants to go full-time, or a hobbyist who needs to fund your passion projects, this podcast will equip you with the tools, resources, and inspiration to make it happen. My name is Bree Noble. I'm a musician, best-selling author, and educator whose mission is to help musicians like you to increase the income you're already making and tap into new income streams so you can create a more diverse, stable, reliable income from music and finally ditch the starving artist mentality. Now let's dive into The Profitable Musician Show. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the podcast. My name is Bree Noble. I'm excited to be here with Ari Herstand. We are going to be talking about his new edition of his book that just came out January 2023. Before we jump into that, though, I can't believe anyone that might be watching or listening doesn't know who Ari Herstand is. But if you don't, I want to make sure that you do. So Ari, just let them know a little bit about you, your background musically and business wise. Sure. Well, thanks, Brie, for having me. Yeah, you know, I was a um, touring singer songwriter for many, many years. I've played hundreds of shows everywhere from living rooms to arenas, everything in between. But after a while, of kind of managing my career all on my own. And, you know, I was based in, in the Midwest then. And I started, uh, I, I had a, a career and was was selling out venues, getting syncs, charting, you know, charting, doing all that stuff, totally independently, no manager, no label, no booking agent, all that stuff. I was, I uh, got a bunch of questions from musicians, like how I was doing it without the support of the industry. And uh, word eventually spread that if you had questions about the music business, go ask Ari. And I tried to get back to everybody. Um, you know, I don't believe in competition in the music industry. I believe a rising tide lifts all ships. And so I, I tried to, you know, support my fellow musicians and share with whatever I was learning, running my own career. Eventually, it got a little bit too much for me to, to uh, get back to everybody. So I just kind of put everything I was learning and knew up on a blog, called it Ari's Take. And then anytime I learned something, I would put it up on the blog. So if I got screwed over at a venue, I'm like, hey, don't make the same mistake I did. This is what I learned or uh, <laughs> all that stuff, you know. The, the trials and tribulations that every indie musician has to go through, most of us learn it the hard way. So as soon as I learned something, I put it up and I'm like, all right, you don't have to make the same mistake I did. You know, after years of this blog kind of finding its way into a lot of uh, indie music circles and communities and I got asked to write for other publications. And uh, through that, it gave me, you know, bigger publications in the music industry. It gave me access to kind of talk with whoever I wanted in the industry. And so I was given an incredible opportunity to sit down with some of the big players in the industry and ask them the questions like that musicians had. So I was sitting down with, you know, Spotify and I was sitting down with agents and managers and YouTube. And, and I felt like this immense responsibility. I'm like, well, most artists don't have this opportunity. So I asked them the questions that uh, I felt that everybody would want to know. And uh, then, you know, musicians came to me and they're like, hey, I've read all your articles. It's super helpful. I appreciate it. But I need something to help me connect the dots. What music business books should I read? And at the time, you know, I'd read most of the music business books. There weren't really any books out there that I felt were relevant talking about the current music industry as it was, as it is. And there were really the most popular music business books were written by attorneys 30 years ago. And I'm like, well, these aren't relevant anymore. Oh, yeah. The Donald Passman book that everybody hears this uh -huh. to read when they start. Yeah. <laughs> I was like, you know, that's cool. I don't I don't know why people keep pointing to this book, considering it was written before the internet. Like, I mean, like, what are we doing here? <laughs> and uh, so for some reason, everybody's like, no, that's the book you should read. I was just like, I read it and like, yeah, if you need to negotiate a 120 page major record contract, okay, this is the book. But until you have that record contract literally in your lap, this book ain't gonna help you. So like, I felt that I needed to write this book because, you know, besides that, you know, no one was telling these stories of these musicians and managers and agents that I saw were succeeding and in innovating in this new music business. Billboard wasn't talking about this. Pitchfork, Rolling Stone, Variety, no one was telling these stories. And I'm just like, man, this is so inspiring talking to all these people of how they're making it work, like actually making a real music career happen in innovative ways, totally DIY, totally independently outside of the mainstream music industry. So I felt I needed to tell their stories and also 
share what I had learned from the hundreds of interviews that I conducted. And so, you know, the first edition of the book came out six years ago. I updated every three years because the, uh, you know, the industry changes so rapidly. And so this new edition, it covers so many of the changes from uh, the last three years, uh, not least of which TikTok and the live streaming and the whole social media landscape that has shifted, but also new royalty collection methods, um, you know, NFTs, metaverse, I even touch on and just pretty much everything that has shifted, you know, the post COVID touring landscape, all of that stuff. Um, so, uh, you know, but these days, I'm still a working musician, I got a funk project, I released a record last year, and I have the podcast, uh, the new music business podcast, which is like, essentially the same interviews that I was conducting before, except now I just let people in on that. Them and it's just uh, make them make them public. So yeah, staying active. Yeah, I would say so. Like I read your email and you're like, this is what's happened since <laughs> I wrote the last book. And I was like, how is he doing all of this? And I get people <laughs> asking me that kind of question. It's like, how are you doing all of this? Yeah. And you know, I know how I do it, but like, I look at what you're doing and I'm like, how are you doing all of this? You've got a a band that's performing and touring and you know you you have run an academy and you're still putting stuff up on the blog and you know I'm sure I know you have help because I've, I've seen you have team members and stuff but like how are you doing all of this yeah the the team at Ari's take is amazing I have some incredible uh supporters and people who are who are on the team who help make everything happen so yes we have uh Ari's take academy we have 5,000 students as part of that we have the podcast where we release an episode every week and you know it's just kind of keeping everything going with social media and all of that and TikTok and, and everything. It's a, a big credit to to the team that makes it happen at Ari's Take. And I know what it takes to write a book too. And, and I know that this book is not just an update. Like you've added, I think you said like a hundred extra pages from the previous yeah. year. You know, it takes some serious focus to, to sit there and write. So kudos yeah. to you that you did that. Thank you. Thank you. I, I found my home, um, my respite, I should say, in New Orleans. Uh, every time I write the book or an update or anything like that, I go to New Orleans. I find that that city is magical. It has an energy unlike any other city in the world, you know, and there's incredible music that I can go out and see every night and get incredibly inspired by. And then I come back and wake up the next morning and run the streetcar tracks and then go plop myself in a, uh, a coffee shop and write all day every day. And fortunately, my cousins live in New Orleans, so I can crash with them for the month. And so that that helps keep me inspired. And that's where I, I go to, uh, to make updates to the book. That's cool. I'll have to think about doing something like that if I write another book, because it, it's hard. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> it's definitely yeah. hard. So yeah. I, I feel like this book should be called, you know, talk about the new, new music business, because I feel like so much changed because of the pandemic. Yeah. And so let's talk about that. I know one of the big things that you said that changed was basically the introduction of TikTok mm -hmm. and people really growing their career organically through social media like that and not even like amazingly not even needing to even put a song out before it becomes huge. Yeah. So talk a little bit about what you say in the book around that. Sure. So I tell a lot of stories of how artists found their audience because of TikTok, uh, frankly. Um, you know, one of these stories is uh, the artist Stacey Ryan. She is a, a young singer songwriter, kind of a jazz pop singer songwriter. And she was working on a song and, and kind of um, she what she was doing is, is, you know, playing piano and singing and just putting up demos or, or song ideas that she had and she would put them up. She put one up and, and somebody commented, they're like, hey, I would love to write a verse to this song. So she's like, oh, okay, that's interesting. I've seen this open verse challenge thing happen. So she uh, she made a, a deeper demo of the song, a little bit more than just the uh, piano vocal version. And she put up this instrumental and basically sang the chorus and is like, all right, now it's your turn. And people had a lot of fun just writing their own verses over her instrumental while she sat there and just pretended like she was listening. And then, you know, using the the duet feature on TikTok, there was uh, around 30,000 people that made duets of her with their own verses. And one of those was the uh, the rapper Zywon K. And his version actually got 40 million views just on his video alone of him rapping along to her open verse challenge. So because of that, the two of them were like, yo, we should release this song together. And uh, people are clearly resonating with the chorus and then with his verse. So here are two artists that had never met before, live on opposite sides of the world. And then 
they decided to release this song, this version together because their collaboration on TikTok did so well and found an audience. So they released a song. It has tens of millions of streams currently. Uh, she was able to negotiate a seven-figure deal, uh, licensing deal with Interscope Records, mind you, where she got to retain all of her ownership and all of her uh, of her masters and her publishing. She retained ownership, seven-figure deal, and uh, now she's topping all the pop charts currently. And uh, that's what can happen, and what we've been seeing happen from from TikTok. That is a pretty amazing story. I think some musicians they get a little bit freaked out about doing stuff like that because they get yeah. very very precious about their you know intellectual property and it hasn't been copyrighted and all you know how do you how do you talk to musicians who are very freaked out about that whole copyright <laughs> thing i should say you should be so lucky right to, that's to be say, infringed they on they don't get it <laughs> like uh i mean yeah we you don't want to get too bogged down in in all of the crazy copyright law or all the laws out there, you know, that that's the thing that the internet has done. It has leveled the playing field. And the thing is, is that it's really, it's a brand new industry and it's it's something that the laws have not caught up caught up with. You know, if you look at the Stacey Ryan example, when with 30,000 people contributing verses to her open verse challenge, you can essentially say that that is 30,000 unauthorized remixes. What she could have done was sent takedown notices and and gone to TikTok and be like, I don't give them permission. They didn't ask me permission to put their own vocals on my song. That is illegal. Take it down. That is what the law dictates that you should that you could do. And that's what the major labels were doing back in 2007 with YouTube when fans would upload lyric videos and upload their own videos with, you know, their favorite songs and the labels were like, "Wait, this we didn't get paid for this. Wait a minute. We didn't give them permission. Uh, YouTube, take it all down. Take it all down. This is awful. This is horrible for our industry. And then realized later, wait, actually, this is amazing for our industry. This is free promo. Wait, what are we doing? We're such idiots. And like, you know, the late the major labels have always been so behind the curve on this. Go back to, you know, the beginning of uh the uh the 21st century with napster and the the labels sued the fans because they're like wait you gotta buy the music from us and like the fans were like yeah but you're charging us 20 dollars for one song because we have to buy this cd that only has one good song in it whereas like napster is giving us the permission and the ability to just get that one song and like you are you know you're taking advantages of music industry and like so the thing is is like innovation is always going to happen and if you can fight it, like the major labels have been fighting it for uh, decades, and finally they have realized more recently, like, oh no, we shouldn't try to squash innovation, we should leverage it. And indie artists have always, and creators, especially the young ones that don't know the laws and don't know what's quote unquote, you know, right or wrong, which is completely subjective, by the way. There is no real right or wrong in the new music business. Like we could, we can go, you know, is stealing right or wrong it's like oh well stealing's wrong right well what about file sharing is that is that wrong is that stealing is that you know we can have debates about like what is right or wrong it's like well what about the death penalty is that right or wrong well that's one of the biggest debates in our society right now there is no black and white when it comes to right or wrong so it's definitely just because something's a law doesn't make it right i think there's a lot of bullshit laws out there especially with the music industry that honestly shouldn't be on the books. And they just, it's too slow to update copyright law. Like, you know, the ma the last big, big changes in copyright law was from 1998, but long before social media or any of that kind of stuff. So I would encourage anyone that's like, wait a minute, but I got to register and they're infringing on my copyright. It's like, yo, get out of your own way. Like you can use the tools at your disposal to find your audience. And then once you have an audience and once you have a career, then you can make sure that everything is working in a way that is supporting your career, whether the law dictates that this is helpful or not. But really, your intention should be always, is this going to help my careers that's going to support my career, not what some bureaucrat in Washington has written down on some dumb law? Is this right or wrong or any of that? Get out of your own way. Oh, I love that. And I, I love your passion about these kind of things. But I was just thinking the other day, like how many artists that I discover because of file sharing, like Napster and LimeWire yeah. and things like that, that I've now streamed like a million times and I would right. never would have, and they've made money from me now, 
but I never would have discovered them had I not had those file sharing services. Yeah, I mean, me too. I mean, you know, it was a discovery mechanism. You know, it was also like, personally, I use Napster and LimeWire and all of that's a kazaa, all that stuff back in the day to find bootlegs to find like hidden versions, unreleased yes. versions of live concerts. Acoustic of... only recorded on a, like a radio station. I have some totally. like that that I, you can't find anywhere else. No. And so like I would still show up at the CD store at midnight for the new version of like the new Dave Matthews record or whatever. And I'm like not downloading necessarily the, the full versions. Um, I still wanted the CD, but I was downloading all the bootlegs that I could find and stuff like that. And, you know, it was just a way to increase fandom. And, uh, you know, there's always been tape trading going back to the Grateful Dead era. And uh, that's something that like, you know, at the turn of the century where when file sharing was a thing, a lot of the people in the jam community are like, well, this has been happening for decades. It's just tape trading. It's the same thing. Like, what's the difference? What's the big deal? And the industry was freaking out and they're like, oh, well, we need people to buy the stuff. So let's punish them and force their hand. Whereas like, you know, pe the, the fans are always going to follow what's most convenient and make sense for them, even if the industry hasn't quite caught up. So if you if you think about why did Napster catch on, it's not because people didn't want to pay for music. It was just more convenient. And it because it's like, okay, there's no way to find these bootlegs at your record stores or anywhere else at the time. Or also, I just wanted one song and you're making me pay $20 for the full CD. That was more convenient. So they used Napster. But then why did, you know, iTunes succeed? iTunes succeeded was because like, well, Napster was not, and, and Kazan, LimeWire and all the rest were not super convenient because oftentimes you download a song that you think it was and it'd be a crappy version, it'd be staticky, it'd actually be a completely different version. Like I thought I was downloading Michael Jackson, it was actually Prince. And like, you don't really, there's no, there, you know, there's like no real quality checks there. It's like, man, this is frustrating. Like I just wanted to hear this song and you know, there's a thousand versions up there. And I can't tell which is the right one. So like iTunes caught on because that was, verified and it's like this is the authenticated version of this song it's like sweet and now you unbundled from making me pay twenty dollars for a cd to making me you know just one dollar and everyone's happy to pay the one dollar but it was still clunky because you're you're downloading and you have to be sorting on your computer but you know what killed piracy once and for all like because there was still there were still people downloading quote unquote illegally in the itunes era what killed piracy was streaming with Spotify. So like, you know, when Spotify launched, it was uh, people decided to pay for music again, not because it was, you know, they, you know, didn't want to be paying before. It was because it was more convenient to do what they actually wanted to do. So if you offer fans the convenient way to experience music and our culture and the community in a way that makes sense to them, they'll pay for it. It just needs to make sense to the fan. Oh yeah, I'm an obsessive playlister and I'm like, oh my gosh, this is what I've always wanted. You know, a great way to just playlist, organize everything that I want in one place. And I used to get so frustrated with iTunes for that. I didn't like the way they did it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And it wasn't totally. across devices and you know, all that stuff. Right. Yeah. I, I look at playlisting as like the, the mixtapes that would make my girlfriend Absolutely. in high school. <laughs> I was obsessed with those in high school. Totally. Yeah. Well, let's talk about, um, I know another big change that happened was the, you know, the MLC and like the changes in royalties yeah. and things like that. So how has that changed from the last version of the book? Yeah. So uh, the Music Modernization Act of 2018 um, officially went into effect, you know, in 2019, but the biggest thing that came from that was the creation of the Mechanical Licensing Collective, the MLC. And basically, not to get into the weeds of this, if you remember about how uh, there were all these lawsuits against Spotify a few years back, and even some against Apple Music and stuff like that, why there were lawsuits from songwriters was because uh, technically the law states that uh, anytime a song is streamed on any of these streaming services, the streaming service has to pay the songwriters a mechanical royalty. Now, the problem was, with all these indie musicians distributing their music to Spotify, streaming functions differently from downloads. So like iTunes needed certain set of rights and they got them. And then when Spotify launched, they're like, oh, let's just do iTunes, but streaming version. And the US law was like, well, that's not exactly how it works for streaming. It's a totally different set of rights. So you can't just be the iTunes of streaming. So Spotify didn't realize that. So then songwriters started suing Spotify because Spotify wasn't paying the songwriters. But Spotify was like, we want to pay the songwriters. We just don't know how to find them because there's, you know, tens of thousands at the time songs uploaded to Spotify every day. A lot of time, most of them are indie. 
And most of the, and unfortunately, they were too late to the draw. Spotify wasn't asking for who the songwriters were. So the distributors weren't asking for who the songwriters were. And then so when the artist would distribute a song, they wouldn't tell the distributor who wrote the song, whether they wrote it, whether it was a cover or anything like that. So what happened now is like the streaming services was like, please stop suing us. Like, let's figure out how to make this happen. And and so and then the music industry is like, sure. But it's so fragmented right now because previously it was like Harry Fox was collecting some mechanical royalties and Music Reports was collecting some mechanical royalties. And even then they didn't know how to who to pay really. And like it was a mess. So what what the MMA said, the Music Modernization Act, they're like, all right, let's create one organization in the United States that is going to collect all the mechanical royalties. So instead of Spotify having to pay Harry Fox and like Pandora going to pay music reports and like all of these other services paying all these different, you know, organizations is like, all right, scrap everything. Everybody is going to pay all of the mechanical royalties, which are owed to songwriters and publishers to the MLC. So then the MLC collects and Spotify was like, oh my God, thank God. They had, you know, $23 $23 million of royalties just sitting in a bank account and they didn't know who to pay. So like, here you go, MLC, you figure it out. Apple had like, you know, a bunch of millions of dollars. In the end, there was like $400 million of unpaid royalties from all these streaming services that went to the MLC. And so the MLC's job was like, all right, we got to find the rightful owners of this $400 million and their songwriters and publishers, but also moving forward, any time a song gets streamed on any streaming service, those in the, in the United States, those mechanical royalties, which are owed to songwriters and publishers are going to get paid to the MLC. And so now every songwriter knows, well, well, they should know, and they'll know if they read my book, <laughs> that if you, if you want to get paid for your streams on Spotify, you either need a publisher or you need to sign up for the MLC and you can do that directly. And so, and then they'll write you a check directly. So if you're using something like SongTrust, do you need yeah. to sign up for the MLC? No, you do not. SongTrust acts as your publisher. So, you know, it's an either or thing. So if you have a SongTrust or a TuneCore Publishing or, you know, CD Baby Publishing or anything that says that has the word publishing in it, they're going to work with the MLC, with ASCAP, BMI, all the performing arts organizations and every other organization around the world that collects mechanical and performance royalties. Because, you know, we know about the ones in the States because, you know, we're in the States, we're like, oh, the MLC is mechanicals. But there's actually like 80 organizations all over the world for every country that collects all of these royalties and they need to know who to pay. So like, you're not gonna be making your phone calls to 80 organizations around the world, you know, to Gemma in Germany and be like, hey, can you pay, oh, sorry, you don't speak English? Shoot, I don't speak German. Um, I don't really know what, can I email you? Oh no, you don't, that's, you don't speak English, so that's not gonna work either. So it's like, that's the benefit of having a publisher or an admin publisher is like what song trust is or centric or TuneCore publishing those are called admin publishers uh they don't own your your copyrights they don't own your publishing they just take a commission and you essentially enlist them to go collect all of your royalties so they'll work with the mlc they'll work with the pros they'll work with all the organizations and so you the songwriter uh you can enlist a song trust or a tune core publishing or something to do this for you and then you do not need to go to the mlc directly yeah, I feel like that's just the easiest way. I know you have to, you know, pay them, of course, because they are doing work for you, but it's yeah. just so much easier because there's so many. And, you know, like you said, all the ones outside of the U.S. or like if you are outside of the U.S., mm-hmm. then, you know, they will they will deal with the MLC and stuff for you, right? If you have, like, say, yeah. you're in Canada and your music's being played in the U.S. Exactly. So yeah, I mean, in the United States, you know, and every country functions a little bit differently. But that's why I prefer to have a publisher doing this. And I'm happy to pay the publisher, you know, a cut of my royalties, because I don't want to deal with the headache. There's enough to handle in a music career anyways, that like, I don't want to have to just work spreadsheets and figure out all the organizations that I need. So like, the fewer people that I need to deal with, like, I'm happy to pay them for it. Yeah. And that's definitely very true. I think for, you know, musicians that are working all the time and recording all the time, someone like me who's recorded three CDs, not currently recording, like I probably don't need that. You know, I can just go find my stuff and and be done. But most musicians that are watching or listening to this are, you know, continuing on with their career, releasing singles and all that stuff. 
it's just so much easier. <laughs> so much easier just to have I think it. so. And yeah, if you have the if you have the time and, and the energy and and you know it excites you to figure out how all of these royalty streams work and how all the laws work and everything like that, by all means, like go for it. But uh for me personally, like I have to be more serious about where I devote my time and energy and efforts. And um I prefer to have as uh, fewer parties to deal with as possible and um, I'm happy to pay them for it or at least give them a piece of the pie. Yeah, agreed. Well, let's talk about the pandemic and how that affected. I mean, obviously, none of us could perform for almost two years. Um, And what did that do to the music industry? It certainly increased live streaming. How do you see that still affecting the music industry now that the pandemic has kind of waned? Right. So musicians got a lot more comfortable with live streaming and understood kind of the function and the benefits of what live streaming could offer, um, both on ticketed live stream platforms and on free live streaming platforms. So, you know, right when the pandemic hit, I teamed up with a couple of my friends and we launched the Uncanceled Music Festival. And we had about 350 musicians from all over the world playing our festival over 10 days. And it was hosted on stage. It. And uh, at the time, that was one of the few ticketed live streaming platforms in existence. Now there's a bunch more out there. And so, you know, a lot of ticketed live stream platforms have popped up and artists can can host ticketed live streams and they still are doing that even post pandemic. It's a way for them to engage their fan base in a way that where they don't have to actually hit the road and still charge tickets for it. It's, you know, And then we're seeing the free live streams, which are like on platforms like Twitch. And Twitch has really taken off in the music community over the last three years. I'm hearing about artists, I'm seeing artists making good livings on Twitch, live streaming multiple times a week. And uh, it's a tightly knit community on Twitch. And so, you know, I I interviewed a, a few musicians who succeed on Twitch for the book and kind of how they were doing it and talk about all of their strategies and methods and and how it's it's working for them. So it's become a lot more niche. You know, yes, there were 100,000 live stream concerts from in just in 2020 and 2021 from artists that couldn't tour and they're just like, well, we're going to throw a concert online. I did one, you know, I did a few actually, and a bunch of people did them. But now, you know, as touring has picked back up, we're in this post pandemic era, people are still live streaming and the Twitch community is stronger than ever. Artists are still starting to live stream on Twitch if they want. And they're understanding that if they do want to live stream, there is a place for it if it makes sense for them, but it's not required. Fortunately, like, you know, you don't have to live stream. And that's kind of the thing with with every platform right now it's like you know you want to do what inspires you and you want to do uh go to where your audience lives and exists so it's something like if live streaming doesn't inspire you you don't want to force it because it takes a lot of energy to learn it like especially if you're going to do the twitch thing you know it takes a lot of time and effort and energy and a little bit of money and investment to get set up on twitch to actually follow the proper etiquette of how to function as a musician on twitch and kind of be welcomed into that community it takes a lot to get set up and if you if that doesn't inspire you and you don't want to do it you're going to get burnt out real quick. Same goes for TikTok. You know, it's like there's a way that you can succeed on TikTok, but it takes consistency in doing it every day, essentially, and understanding the community and the etiquette of TikTok. And like, you know, if your audience isn't really necessarily on TikTok or your target demo that you're focusing on, they're not spending the majority of their time on TikTok, you don't have to. It's like, yes, TikTok is incredibly powerful at reaching new people, but it does, it's definitely not for everyone. And that's where it, we're at kind of in this new music business is that all the tools are, are there, whether it's Twitch, whether it's TikTok, whether it's Instagram, whether it's NFTs, whether it's Patreon, whether it's, you know, whatever it is, Bandcamp, there's all these tools out there. And you can, it, it can be absolutely daunting and overwhelming because there are so many tools, but that's why you have to figure out what is important to you who you're looking to target and what kind of career you want to have because the same thing that happened you know that works for me is not going to be the same thing that works for you everybody has different strengths different desires and succeeds and excels in different ways so you just have to kind of find what makes sense to you and then go all in on that yeah it's spreading yourself too thin you're just not going to make an impact anywhere I think right. you've got to let go. Okay, I'm going to go all in on YouTube or whatever it is. Yeah. Do, do you find that there are 
musicians who are actually making their living as a content creator. Like maybe they're not even trying to like promote their next single or whatever. They're just out there, you know, creating TikTok or YouTube and that's how they're making their money. Absolutely. Uh, my friend Justin Vibes, uh, he's a vibraphone player. Oh yeah, he's pretty incredible. Uh, he has 8.5 million TikTok followers by playing the vibraphone. So everybody go check him out. Check out Justin Vibes on TikTok. And he makes a very good living through brand sponsorships and brand deals because uh, he's built up this following. You know, people are essentially paying him as a creator, as a content creator, as, a, as an influencer, a TikToker, but he's doing it through his music, through playing the vibes. Hmm, that is cool. Yeah. Yeah, if you've got something unique enough, for sure, you can do that. So let's touch on this one. I know whenever I, I bring this up, it blows my audience's mind a little bit, but talking about crypto and sure. NFTs and things like that, um, maybe in as plain speak as we can, because I know every time I start to think about it, I'm like, I feel like this is just so like, you can't put your hands around it. Like, it seems like it could be anything, especially NFTs. Yeah, sure. So yeah, and, and I think currently NFTs are not for everyone. And it's, um, it's not something that as an industry, we if you don't want to focus on it, you don't have to it's not like something that is going to be it's not mainstream yet. But that being said, there are musicians and artists who have found incredible fan bases within the NFT community and revenue streams. Frankly, I had this Latin country artist, Sammy Ariaga on the new music business podcast. And he this was really interesting. He created an NFT for his new song uh, called Meta Girl, like M E T A, like metaverse, you know, meta girl kind of a thing. So he created this this song. He turned it into an NFT, hosted it on his own NFT platform that he had, kind of on his on his website. It was it was you know he went all in on this. He teamed up with some developers. He'd like designed this thing, and how he promoted it was he's like, all right. And, and mind you, he has a lot of fans. He was he was signed to Sony Records. He was dropped by Sony. You know, he actually had a pretty large following on TikTok. He, you know, had a publishing deal. So he was like, you know, working musician. But he's like, my fans don't know NFTs. They don't know crypto or anything like that. So I'm not going to go to my fans with this. I'm going to go to the NFT community. Where do they exist? They're on Twitter and more specifically Twitter spaces. So what he did was he would go into these Twitter spaces rooms. He'd listen to people in the NFT rooms talk about NFTs and then he'd raise his hand to speak and they'd pull him up and they're like, hey, he'd be like, hey, I've heard you guys talk about NFTs. We, there's a lot of conversation here. You mind if I play you a song? And they're like, oh, cool. Uh, yeah, sure. So he played a song and he's like, by the way, I have an NFT of this song if you want to grab it. So now he found his community of people who love NFTs. They went and bought his NFT. He made $250,000 selling his song as an NFT to the NFT community, because it was like, you can, you know, you don't always have to find an audience that may love the style of music that you make. People want to support those like them. That's why I always tell everybody, find your community, whether, you know, there's, there's always going to be a Venn diagram of crossover if they like your music or not, but you want to support your friends and your family and people in your community. And so what, you know, they supported him and they're like, oh my gosh, this is so cool. They bought his NFT. And so, that's, you know, he went and found that community. Now, what we're seeing uh, moving forward is that people are using the blockchain technology with NFTs, but more so turning this into the next wave of fan funding. And so instead of like Patreon, where it's it's like patronage, you know, you, you pay your favorite creators or artists a couple bucks a month or whatever, and just because you just want to support them. That's that's the Patreon model and, and it works well for some people. Moving forward, what we're seeing is fan investing. So you can go to your fans and be like, hey, I have this new song. I'm selling 50% of the royalties of this song. And if you want to, if you want to invest in me, you can own a percentage of this song. And so people own is is the incorrect word. You can like, you know, buy a percent of these uh, royalties and, and earn on this song rather. But own is just an easier term to use, even though it's not legally correct. But anyway, they're not, you know, they don't, you don't need their permission if you're going to get a sync in that kind of ownership. But, um, you know, and so what we're seeing here is that people are essentially selling off percentage of the royalties. And so if you earn, you know, million bucks on the song, 
and 50 people own 50% of that song, that $500,000 of those royalties get split amongst the people who bought a percentage of your song. And that's all being built, you know, on the blockchain technology right now. So you can use the NFT technology, the blockchain technology, and that's what we're seeing moving forward uh, for some of these use cases. Yeah, I know you and I both interviewed LabelCoin, and that's kind of yep. the system that they've set up to do that, which I thought was super interesting. Yeah, LabelCoin is innovating in the space, definitely. And, uh, you know, full disclosure, I'm on the advisory board of LabelCoin. And I think what they're doing is extremely innovative. And that's, this is a, their exact model. And they kind of, they call themselves the Robin Hood of music. And I think that's a great, you know, comparison, because it is kind of like buying stocks, but in a way that's so seamless and easy, where the fan doesn't need to know about the technology happening behind the scenes, because that that was the disconnect with that's the real disconnect when it comes to NFTs and like why it didn't really catch on to the mainstream is like average fans don't want to get a MetaMask. Right, wallet, a digital wallet and all that stuff. Digital yeah. wallet and they need to buy, figure out how to buy Ether on the Ethereum blockchain and then they got to go and figure out gas fees. Or musicians it's, have to figure out how to mint, it's, you know, it's like- Get out oh. of here, that's so complicated. It's like, come on, <laughs> like, can we simplify this? And it's like, and like, let alone, sure, it's complicated for musicians, but then think about fans and you're like, hey, go buy my NFT. And the fans like, uh, what? <laughs> so, you know, the thing is, is that's what's going to, that's when it's going to catch on mainstream is when it's as easy as buying something on Amazon is going to be buying an NFT or, you know, that's when it's going to catch on when you can use your credit card and, you know, you don't need to use your digital wallet or, you know, buy crypto or anything like that. And we're moving in that direction. And what LabelCoin has done, which I thought it was super innovative, is not only do they allow fans to invest in songs, but they allow curators, um, people, you know, music lovers or people in the industry that support them to create like yourself. Like you said, you make you love making playlists so you can make a playlist of your favorite songs and then people can essentially invest in your playlist and say, I like Bree's taste in music. She's got the her pulse on the finger of what is coming down the pipe here that I'm not really paying attention to. So I'm gonna actually invest in your playlist. That money that they take gets split up amongst all the songs on the playlist and a little bit goes to you. And so as these songs in your on your playlist start to grow and earn royalties, the people that invested in your playlist and royalties, but so do you as the curator of this, almost like, you know, a playlister or a radio DJ or something like that. But, you know, this is a way that instead of how artists needed to crowdfund for albums um, and then they have to like send out, you know, signed lyric sheets and other, you know, rewards in the mail, you can run a song investment campaign and, you know, make a bunch, make the money up front that you need to kind of uh, market the record or go in the studio or anything like that. And it's kind of the next wave of crowdfunding. It's kind of like crowdfunding 1.0 was Kickstarter. Crowdfunding 2.0 is Patreon. And this is kind of crowdfunding 3.0, which is this song investing. Yeah, I really loved it when Mark was explaining it. And when he told me about the playlisting, I'm like, well, I've been a curator for how many years now with Women of Substance? Like, I need to do this, but I haven't, I haven't done it yet. But it's cool. It's a very cool way of doing things. Yep. Awesome. So, okay, one more thing I wanted to cover from the book, because I know that you said, you know, the original book was really more for artists. And now you've kind of added in all these other careers that people can have in the music industry. And I do talk to a lot of people that are like, I love music. I studied music when I was growing up, but I don't want to be an artist. I'm not interested in that lifestyle, but I want to be around music. So you kind of cover a lots of things people can do in the industry. Yeah. So I have a brand new chapter and it's called a hundred plus jobs in the music industry, other than recording artists. Mm. And it's an extensive chapter and I cover, you know, A to Z, all of these jobs. So if you are interested in music and I encourage you to browse that chapter and see if there are jobs that uh, pique your interest, I don't just list them. I actually describe them and point you in the right direction of how you can kind of break into that field if you're interested in it. Yeah, there's probably a lot of jobs that I we don't even know exist that are deep, you know, within the music industry. That I learned a lot. I, I put out, you know, calls to all of my colleagues and friends and inner circle and posted about it and wrote about it. And like, I got a, a lot of 
responses from people in every tiny little corner of the industry. And so I kind of sourced a lot of this. I don't claim to have all the answers for anything, but I'm really good at sourcing them. And uh, and so I sourced all of this information and I, I got it from so many people. And, and I learned a lot. I learned about a lot of jobs that I didn't know existed. And it was, it was pretty inspiring. That's very cool. Well, one thing I want to touch on before we finish up is that I have always really admired your advocacy and, you know, being that we both live in California, I was really watching the whole, you know, AB5 thing. And so maybe you could explain a little bit about that. And I just want to say, I appreciate the work that you did around that because that was really frustrating me when that came out yeah. um, and maybe explain like what you did, because you did a lot. <laughs> Yeah, I did. And, and um, yeah, I, I do. And I do tell the story in the book this time around, because it was something that, you know, I, I never expected to do. I, I never expected to get into politics. I still don't really want to and, and don't care to be. But I found myself at this crazy intersection with in the position to to help affect change. And I and I felt that it was kind of my responsibility to do it. But just for people that aren't familiar with what happened, it was, you know, in in 2019, they signed a law, the governor Newsom signed a law in California called AB5 that essentially made independent contracting illegal. You couldn't you couldn't designate anyone as an independent contractor, like everybody had to be an employee. So what that means for musicians was like, if I wanted to hire a drummer for 100 bucks for my gig on Saturday, I couldn't just Venmo him $100 and be done with it. I actually had to set up a payroll company. I had to put this drummer on payroll. I had to withhold taxes. I had to get workers' compensation insurance. I had to get all these other various insurances. I had to incorporate myself. I had to, you know, so like something that was supposed to be easy in a $100 gig for this drummer now is costing me thousands of dollars because I have to set up this, I have to essentially incorporate myself as a corporation. And it was just like, it was crazy. And so, you know, when this was signed into law, initially this law was proposed to help protect Uber and Lyft drivers and say like, all right, these giant companies can take better care of their drivers. And we're all like, okay, yeah, that sounds reasonable. And sure, they're billion dollar companies. Like, sure, they can afford to put their drivers on payroll, whatever. But indie musicians, <laughs> it didn't make sense for, but also the entire music industry, it didn't make sense for, because the same thing, if I wanted to go play a gig at a venue, the venue would have to put me on payroll as a singer songwriter and be like, oh, now I'm an employee of the venue for this one gig. Yeah, or if you hire a wedding singer or a wedding band, thing. right? Yep. All of that. Anyone. So what we saw. So here's the thing. Like nobody in the music industry that I knew heard about this law or knew that this was affecting. I learned about it a month before it was being implemented after it was already signed into law. So like we're talking the end of 2019. It was going into effect start of 2020. I learned about this. So then I started freaking out and I wrote an Ari's Take blog article about it saying, yo, the California music industry is about to crash. And this is why. And that blog article went viral. At the end of it, I was like, tweet the congresswoman who wrote the, the assemblywoman who wrote this and tweet the governor and write letters and here's how to do it. So their offices were getting thousands of letters and tweets. And they're like, Oh, my gosh, wait, what's going on here? What happened? And so, you know, I was then getting into Twitter battles with the assemblywoman who wrote this bill. And she's like, Well, why don't you come to my office? And let's talk about it. I'm like, Yeah, okay, cool. So I rallied up some musicians, we went into her office, and we told her about it. And she's like, Oh, okay, well, y'all you the whole music industry and all the unions have to agree on this. And I was like, what I was going to all of these legislators offices offices. I sat in the Senate majority leader's office. I remember this meeting very well because there's like 10 musicians. We're all sitting around his office. He's sitting there, Senator Robert Hertzberg. And he was like, we, well, I'll tell him our story. We tell him everything like why this doesn't work for us. And he's like, wow, we really few you guys, huh? <laughs> and we're like, yeah, you did. He's like, huh? And we're like, okay, so can you can you change this? He's like, nah, no, nah, no, nah, we can't. I'm like, wait, why not? You just said you fucked us. Like, why Why wouldn't you do something to help us? He's like, wow, we just, you know, it's just not that easy. You know, the only way that I can get my colleagues to come along with a new bill and a new thing is like, you need public pressure. I'm like, go on. It's like, wow, you got to get in this publication. And, you know, they read this journal and they read this newspaper and they pay attention to these TV shows and news stations. I'm like, so I'm, I'm taking furious notes. And I was like, oh, okay, okay, okay. So then I went to all those publications and all those news programs. I literally drove down to San Diego to the Assemblywoman's home district and went on her local news station and called her out by name saying she's us. And like, she doesn't care to help us. And why is she against all indie musicians? Like, why do you hate music? Why why do you hate indie musicians? And she was like, what the? 
like, and so she's tweeting at me, you know, 10 minutes after this air, she's like, you misrepresented me. I'm like, well, then help us. And it was kind of like, you know, I got a crash course in politics. This is like, no one cared to do anything, even though they knew it was wrong and that they should write this wrong until they got massive public pressure. So in the end, you know, we had got 185 thousand signatures from California music professionals that we would armed with this petition to go and say, hey, we have 185,000 signatures on this petition saying we don't like this law. Can you change it now? Like now? Nah. So like, okay, we'll, we'll just continue to embarrass you a little bit more with your constituents. If that's what's really going to take, like that's what's going to, and they, you know, I was fighting with the unions because, you know, the unions, you know, I, I would consider myself on principle pro-union, but not the music, not the musicians union, the AFM got in our way. They were the ones that are like, oh, we like this law because this law will encourage everybody to be uh, a W2 employee, which they'll join the union. They'll join the AFM. That makes sense. And I was like, wait a minute, but I don't know anyone in the AFM. What do you do again? Oh, you represent orchestral musicians. Okay. Well, no one here really is playing in a symphony orchestra like the LA Phil that's required to be in the union and you're not helping any of us. So like, can you get out of our way, please? And they're like, no, 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 we, we want this. And the assembly woman was like, you know, oh, the, you know, they, the unions, uh, they're the ones that support her campaign and all of these politicians campaign. So they're like, well, we're going to do whatever the union wants. And it's like, okay, then I guess we have to keep embarrassing you because the union is not actually supporting us. They're not fighting for us just because they're called the musicians union doesn't mean they support musicians, doesn't mean they represent musicians. And so it was like all of this hand wringing and like I'm literally sitting down in the union's office and like battling it out with them across the table and writing the language like it came down to me fighting with the president of the AFM local 47 here on language. And we were like, literally, like, I literally had a hand in writing the language of this new law and that of this new bill. And eventually we got the bill passed and signed into law, which just exempted the music industry, you know, music professionals from this law that just didn't make sense for us. But it was a, it was a wild ride. And it's like, I was like, man, I'm not a politician. I don't want to be in politics, but I like, I can't believe that this is what was required from not just me, but like all the other people that helped with this in like the organization I was, I was part of and just like all these scrappy musicians coming together to kind of do this is like what it required. It was crazy. That is amazing. Yeah. I hadn't heard like all that backstory of it. I'd just been following it in your emails and I was so sure. glad that you were like even bringing this to our attention. Cause I had no clue, you know? know, and I'm crazy. a yeah. musician in California, you know, and <laughs> oh, wow. Well, thank you for all the advocacy. I mean, you do tons of other advocacy online too, as far as like, you know, calling out scammers that are scamming musicians and things like that. So I really appreciate that uh, as someone that works with musicians that I know have benefited from that. And so is there any, when this comes out, your book will already be out. Is there anything else you want people to know or, you know, where should they buy? Buy it, all of that stuff. Yeah, yeah. You can get the book wherever you like to get books. So if it's Amazon, it's it's on Amazon. If you like, you know, a local bookstore, you go support your local bookstore. There's uh, there's going to be an audio version of the book. I'm I just mm. finished recording the audiobook. So if you prefer audiobooks, you can get it that way, or or ebooks, or however you do it. Is there hardback and paperback? No, it's just hardcover. Oh, hardback. Okay, the hardback is amazing. You guys, it's on my shelf. I don't know if you can see it. It's like, <laughs> back, but yeah, it's a thick one. I got it. I'm it's, like pointing it's, and realizing I'm like, uh, you yeah. know, backwards on Zoom. So I'm like trying to point at it. It's not working very well, but yeah, it's, yeah, it's, it's on my uh, shelf. It's a really nice hardback book. You. So I, I really encourage you guys to go buy this. Even if you have the first edition, this is so it's almost like a different book. So, cause it's a different world really yeah. from when he <laughs> released it last time. So thank, thank you. you so much, Ari, you guys check out Ari's take. If you haven't, there's so many helpful articles. I always point everyone that I work with that's releasing music to your blog, where you compare all the different distributors, because it is like comprehensive. And I'm like, I'm not going to even bother like writing anything up yeah. on this. This is exactly what everybody needs. So thank you. there's so many helpful resources there. So you guys check that out, get the book. And thank you, Ari, so much for lending us all of your knowledge and telling all these really entertaining stories that just make me want to read the book more. <laughs> Thanks, Bree. Thanks for listening to The Profitable Musician Show. I would love to know your takeaways and aha moments from this episode. Leave me a comment over at ProfitableMusician.com so I can bring you more of the information, interviews, and resources that you love. 
Thanks to Rondi Fay, one of my Academy members, for providing the music for our podcast. You can check her out at rondifay.com. That's R-A-N-D-I-F-A-Y.com. Just remember, knowledge is power, but without implementation, it is useless. And inspiration without action is merely entertainment. But I know you're not just a dreamer, you are a doer. And I promise I'll be here every week to support you and remind you that you can be a profitable musician.